and welcome to this special for Overdrive. Today we're going to be looking at two companies that are actually quite, I'd say, quite uh, popular with us, aren't they? To some people they might think, what is any connection with these two there companies? Is there, is but yeah. we have discovered along the way that there is more connections between them than you'd actually realise. Mm. And the companies involved are Saab and Rover. Or NG Rover. One of them in particular is very close to all that, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. As you may well have worked out from previous episodes, maybe. You will have if, I, if you haven't by the end of this year. You will. <laughs> <laughs> but one of them, none of us are actually under car from. That's true. It is. One came very near. Yeah, you had the chance. And I wish I'd actually had that chance now, I just to say I'd had the vehicle, but you'll find out about that. I well. think we've all had that at some point, wishing we would bought a car that mm, Yeah, <laughs> well, it was close but no cigar, but I, I do hope whoever actually has gone and got that car, it's gone to a very good owner, because believe me, that was a car worth having. But first, we have a look at a Saab 96V4, and this is a replica of a rally car that was actually driven. Um, and this, this was actually driven by the particular rally driver as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. Can we get his name right? We'll try this bit of a tongue twister his last name, but we can't just say his first name because uh, there is a certain other name like this. So it is Stig Blomsvall, isn't it? Or yeah. Bloomquist. 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 It's, yeah. it, do you know to me the last name's a bit like a Bond villain name? Uh, I, I just keep conjuring up a Bond film when I hear the last name, but it's a Swedish rally driver and a very famous He's Swedish, a Swedish rally, driver. rally driver. He actually drove the uh, 9.6 to an actual win, uh, and the actual number plate for that actual car is on the back of the 9.6. Yes, the original is on this, it's got a massive piece of history on the back of that car. Today you find us in St Anne's. We won't say sunny St Anne's, will we? Not no. sunny. As you can it see by cool. the hats. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we are here to do a special today. So this is the this is one of the parts of it. And we have I hope we're not hiding this from the camera from you. Yeah, we're not, not intentionally doing this. A Saab 9.6 this is a replica of the car that took, how do you say it? <laughs> I think I'll try this one. Is it Stig Blomquist? Blomquist or something Blomquist. like that. Blomquist. Blomquist. It's, a bit, it's a bit of a tongue twister, it, but it is signed by Stig Blomquist. It is. It's signed in two places. You might just be able to see it here. Also signed on the wing. And for the people who are not sure, Malcolm, who is a stinger? He was one of the Saab rally drivers who won in 1971 in a car very similar to this. This one has been built from scratch as a replica of that car. And the story behind that is quite interesting as well. There's so much to this car, isn't there? How uh, we've been told how certain parts have come from certain countries and so on. And yeah. So much has been sourced from overseas in terms of parts. It's one of those cars, every time you see something about it and mention it, there's a little tale behind it. There's all sorts of things about this car. Isn't there? Personally, I've not spent a lot of time around classic cars, so it's really, really nice to get a chance to have a good nosy round one and see what it's like, really. Yeah. Let's go and have a look. Right, so what we've got here is all some magazine footage with photographs before and after what you see of the car now. Yeah. As you can see, the car actually started out green. We wouldn't have even known yeah, that. We would have known that, would we? Uh, you can see the build going on, and there's actually this one here. Let me come and pick up now. It's got the, uh, the number plate that we saw, the original number plate on the rear. <laughs> That's a really good feature. There's some nice, interesting pieces in these, aren't there? Some lovely photographs. They really are some nice the original, original photographs yeah. there, yeah. That's the, of course, that's of course the original 
um, Barry Carlin, which Gordon we look at today, is, yeah. uh, is based on. I think that's the reason why yeah, it's so I can see so much You tease it, yeah. Yeah, um, probably just noticed that, yeah. And then, of course, we've got some pictures here of the restoration of the one that we're going to film in today. Uh, it's amazing to see, as it is, like that, when you see the finished product, as we can see. It is, I mean, you can see, you know, how, it's, how, the, how the product started and you've got all the, the processes sort of in between leading up to where you see it now. Mm. Uh, and it's quite remarkable really the amount of work that's gone into it. It's when you look see the magazine features, you, you, you realise that. And I've just got to say this to you. Second of December 1971 is older, older than me. And look at it, it's an original copy. Plenty of features and footage in there. It's just, it's got all this history that just backs all the car up, doesn't it? Yeah, Yeah, you keep looking at things and finding things and I think you could look at this all day and just find little, little details here and there that yeah. just, but you didn't notice first of all that it just yeah. it really takes me back to the even like a touch of a sweet screen. Fantastic. Oh, now I'm stuck. That's it. There's two in from the side as well, I think. Oh, oh. Hang on. No, he's pulled it out. But we'll soon see. Ah, yeah, and then yeah. over the top of the thigh. Uh, and there's going there. there. So it's a five point. Ah. There's one at the other side. Oh. Come through the seat. Yeah, yeah. And the two over your shoulders. And... That's it. I have to say, this is something I've always wanted to, to do. <laughs> is that is that, that an emergency fuel cutoff there? Is it? Is that an emergency fuel cutoff between the seats? Or uh, that's a fire extinguisher. Fire or oh, the fire extinguisher? So yeah. Pull and everything goes off. And it, in the gearbox, what's uh, gear? I thought that's what gearbox is in it. Assuming a manual of some description, it'd well, be yeah, a col that's column that's change, a isn't it? Yeah. <coughs> It's it's I have break. a video of Stig Blomquist showing his son how to use this because his son, believe it or not, had never seen a column change yeah. car before. Yeah. That's first. Yeah. And then straight down second. Yeah. And away third. And down. Uh, no, the other way around, isn't it? That's first. Second. Third. Yeah. Down fourth. And reverse. You pull it right up the top and down. Wow. <laughs> so it's a four-speed column change manual, basically. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Uh, it's got free wheel on it as well, but I, I never use free right. wheel because I like the edge of braking. Yeah. How I've been re uh, reliably informed is that all these uh, solves that were delivered to the UK market uh, had a oblong um, headlight grill. This one, you can see all the, the entire piece here, the round headlight grill. Mm. Uh, has actually come from uh, Louisiana in the United States. This is for US market cars. The lights themselves, obviously they would have to find some lights in order to fit that because yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is the grill that the Rally car uh, would have come with, not the Oblong. Uh, have actually come out of a Mark 1 Gold GTI. Oh, uh, well, you would know you that. believe? <laughs> it's it's, it's um, had donor parts and things from nearly everywhere we can think of, hasn't it? But looking at it, and you can see, can't you? You can see how they now, would go into a Golf. Yeah, um, you, now you think about the, that one Golf and yeah. study it for a second in your mind, you can see these. You can picture that, yes. Yeah. But you wouldn't at first. You wouldn't. And the other thing to mention, of course, is that you spotted this, Martin. I um, did, yeah. What about that? The set of badge with the plane. This little plane logo there underneath. Some people might not actually know, but Saab was manufactured. Plates. I'm just going to ask you that. Yeah, Malcolm, I was just going to come in and query that, but yeah, as you may remember, as we Malcolm touched on with uh, the Sav we did before, the bonkers advertising where they basically made out that all their Sav was fighter jets, and you come to an end of a cliff, the next minute a jet was up in there, and they took it so literally, didn't they, yeah. that they had the night panel button on Saab's where you could shut your dash off practically? Yeah, um, but basically Saab did start off manufacturing airplanes. 
So that's where it all came the, from. But uh, the, logo the bunker series sort of continued, didn't it? It's just in case you're doing a bombing run on M4 or something like that, you could switch all your dashboard. <laughs> I think it's a really nice article, yeah. You can see the, the own, uh, you're in the car in that photo there, and you can see more of the interior. You do, you see everything uh, being done, as I pointed out, the, that original number plate, which we saw on the back. The suspension components there, and he goes into a lot of detail, obviously if you read the article we'll be able to tell. Mm. Uh, but even the pictures tell a story themselves, don't they? Really? They do, yeah. As the car, Every little piece, look at your car, there's a story behind it, and all this just really backs up everything we've been discussing and filming today, and it's it's just a wonderful history feature, isn't it, to see all this? I certainly, I think we want to be uh, doing more cars like this on the overdrive, I think it'd be fantastic. It just shows what you can find, it's yeah. lovely hidden and gem, this, and, and you can see with all this, just look at what went into it, it really is. So that's all that. That's all literally. And so it's not just a car that you see, it's all it's the all history this, and the go Everything backs yeah. it up. All this proof. Right down to the, just these sheets here. With all this on about it. Tell you more history about the car itself. So this is all written by the original car? Yeah. The uh, original rally winner, I believe, chap, is in a museum in Sweden, is it not? Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Uh, so the car that, that we looked at um, is as Malcolm said, a replica. Yeah. Just look at it now. It's a beautiful thing to see. It's the, the actual, I mean, the um, the actual restoration of the car as well was done pretty locally with uh, Mal, um, Malbrand, 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 yeah. yeah. Not far from me, um, no, good 10, 15 minutes away from where I am. Yeah, about five minutes drive from where I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a lovely car. Uh, I was lucky enough on like, these chaps to have a quick ride in it around the block because we did some uh, <laughs> some filming. It was it was so taken aback by being in the car. I think uh, as I got some footage on my phone and I got a thumbs up and a big beam and all. Yeah, it was very enjoying it. No, I never had to see that on. I don't remember that because you couldn't move. Uh, it was absolutely. Yeah, oh, yeah. Five, 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 five point, well, the five points yeah. seat belt on this thing, just like the proper rally car. Yeah, well, yeah, I literally just fitted in. I think if I'd had a few more pounds on, uh, it would have been a bit I, I, didn't, I didn't dare because I knew I, once I got in, I probably wouldn't get out. <laughs> so I didn't attempt it. Um, <laughs> but it only had, I believe, 115 horsepower, which is the same as my Vauxhall Astra, although you would never have known because that car really, well, it certainly felt like it. But don't forget as well, you've got a car that's stripped out. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the yeah. heaviest thing inside that car, other than yourselves, mm. would have been the roll cage. The roll cage, yeah. 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 Um, but it's actually quite an, in, in, quite an innovative car because um, there was the, the other the company, I can't remember what they were called at the time, but they became Audi. They were the only other company who put the engine above the wheels. Mounted it, yeah, right over far forward. And the engine was right far forward in that. Yeah. And so even though it wasn't the most powerful rally car and was no good on the straight, when it got to the corners. Corners of the rally car, that was fine, didn't it? Yeah, because mm. the weight was over the dry wheel, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, it's, yeah, it was all forward and, and pressed on the wheels. So one of those cars, no matter what piece of car you looked at and question something about it, there was a little bit of history or a tale to tell about yeah. any little part well, the, of the car. And the, on the picture with the, when it's green, you sort of see it on the uh, on the ramp. And this is bad. basically, this car had been found in a scrapyard uh, and it was fully restored. Uh, you, it's got the original oblong headlights yeah. that were UK spec and of course the Winning car had the round rounds, yeah, yeah. So you had to source them. They came from America. Yeah, they're off a US spec car, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Um, and then they do bits from all over. I think there was one of the wings that was from Belgium. Yeah, things like that. Yeah, it was just incredible. Well local parts as well. It, every 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 part of the car I looked at, so there it was like. Yeah, that's from <laughs> that's yeah. from that, and it was a, there was an incredible knowledge and story of every the part of it. Pat, you couldn't point to where there was a, there was a tale to tell yeah. about it or yeah. something. Or this came from here, or I had trouble with this. And like, like I mentioned in previous episodes of Overdrive, sometimes the story behind the car is is the most interesting thing about well, it. Well, this app certainly had a story. It had a story. It had, it had more than a story. Um, it had so much even to back up everything that had been done with the car as well. It, there was no. 
question of someone could say, oh, that's not being signed by him. Anyone could have just scribbled that yeah. on there. It was genuine. It was yeah. genuine. Yeah. There was no mucking about with this. It was what it said on the tin. Yeah, and on the on the car's first outing, uh, it was actually that was when it was driven and signed by right. Stig Bloom. But talking of stories and history now, and I believe there's a bit of a history behind Saab and, and, and also Rover as well. Yes, um, I mean, you know, we know that. Well, some people don't realise this, but we, you know, Saab came from the aeroplane division and was mm. eventually then separated out. Yeah. And this was this particular car, the 96, when it actually won the rally in 1971, was the car that put Saab actually on the map. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the previous car before that was the 92, which was um, the two stroke engine, where um, you had barely adequate brakes, and if you were actually going downhill, you had to keep. <laughs> well, we took it on this before, where it was. It? I won't say dangerous car, but a very risky car to be driving. <laughs> you basically had to keep dabbing on the power even when you were going downhill yeah. uh, to keep everything flowing. But if you wanted to also rely on your brakes, it wasn't brilliant, so it was a bit of a 50-50 gamble <laughs> driving a car like that. And a lot, a lot of the problems were sorted out with the 9.6 and the, the there was one 4 there. as well was, uh, was, for the time, a pretty astounding engine. Yeah, um, Saab started to move on leaps and bounds then, didn't it? And yeah. we have... Both me and Malcolm in discussion team before we have touched on Saab a lot. We even filmed another Saab, didn't we, the 9.5? We filmed the 9.5, we did a few 9.3s as well. We did. Uh, there were one that they got away for me, the, the, the 9 convertible, the yeah. 9 convertible always got away from me, which I should have got, um, because we're featured more of that. I'd love to know I actually got that car, but... Uh, we could always try and find out, because the Saab garage is still there, and... I keep my eye on that garage because I think if any stock changes dramatically, we may try and pay him a visit again. Mm-hmm. It, it would be because I, I didn't, I didn't you've didn't never been, one, and if for all it's a small place, and the chap just said, "There's the cars, get on with it." There you go. It, it was very accommodating, and he said, "You can come and go whenever you like." Mm-hmm. So I'd like them to get the all the different sounds in and such, so we yeah. could probably make pay a second visit there. So I think we'll keep an eye on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, a lot of history. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not particularly well up on the history of uh, Saab's uh, rallying and uh, sort of uh, history. Um, but I know these chaps are. Uh, is there any other particular highlights? Well, I think me and Mark can just remember the rally and especially the same as like we had Audi and so on. Yeah. You know, like the bomb well, through the woods in Wales yeah, and things. Yeah, there was also, you know, Rally Cross as and well. And there was the yeah. Rally Cross. Um, you know, you our uh, world of sports. I mean, oh, no, well, world well, of well, sports seem to go big on things like that, didn't yeah. they? They loved it. And you had grandstand on BBC for all the, the football and stuff yeah. like that, and then you'd have world of sport for all the wrestling, the yeah. boxing, the rally cross. But let's not league. forget, at that time, Sam was a big byword then, wasn't it? Mm. It was big. And you also, as we've said before, you also got the bonkers advertising. Yeah. yeah. There's a bit of a link with the car that we saw last week uh, that you'll see as well um, with the aircraft side of things. Because if you notice, you remember, chaps, yeah, the uh, front badge. Yes. And a little yeah. little picture of a plane. We did, it, didn't it? On yeah. And I think it's details like that that are really, you know. Well, to say Sam were more into planes first and before the other cars. Even so, they drifted more into the cars, obviously, which continued. Still, they're still there in the uh, aeronautics. They, they are, yeah. Uh, cars seem to become more the bag for a good while, but they never let go of the fact that they were to do with planes. Yeah. And even in every commercial, every little thing they could get away with, even down to actually things in the cars, they still like to drum it into you that... We did with planes. Yeah. Right down to the magic. Even that's where at that time there were two yeah. separate divisions owned by two the one companies. But because they were so bonkers and adamant, they, they, they thought, we've got to tell you this. Don't forget, we still do this. We do that. And yeah. You can be driving a Saab and you say, what's this button for? Night panel. Press it. Oh, I mean, the display's gone off, except yeah. for me. Um, so they had to spin it up. C5 had that. <laughs> and I used to think to myself, why? What? It just gets back to that, that to aviation side of thing, yeah. doesn't it? You know, and comparing it down to the minimum. As when we filmed the 95, we found things like 
for the courtesy lights and things like that up above, everything felt like it was from inside a play. Mm. They were all on ball things that rotated yeah. and yeah. Uh, toggle the switches the and everything was. was National Express. <laughs> the coaches or you can go yeah. and twiddle the vents and the lights and they're all on these like ball sockets. I right? think they just all these little details of the play and they just hark back to like, say, And say, we noticed that if you didn't click your seatbelts in, it, there was a thing above saying <laughs> yeah. seatbelt to, seat, yeah. to pass yeah. in it. I expected a stewardess coming from behind us <laughs> in, in the car saying, you know, exit to oh, the <laughs> <drink. laughs> trolley coming through between you and shift and that. But it, it's just that bonkers way that you don't have to know about cars, but you know you're in the south. Yeah. I think this is what makes them so successful with the rallying as well. Um, it's because, obviously, Sarvis from Scandinavia, you know, they are designed to withstand... Swedish man. <laughs> <laughs> they are designed to withstand, you know, tough conditions, harsh, harsh yeah. weather conditions, harsh, harsh um, road conditions. And I think this is one of the reasons why they're just built so tough, they're so reliable, but they've got a reputation for liability and safety. Do you think this was a bit of a Achilles heel for them, that the fact they were so like this, that when they were owned by Vauxhall in General Motors, that they sort of shot themselves in the foot? Yeah. Because they were so adamant for safety and things that even when Vauxhall was saying, look, this is a new insignia, we want it to be your next uh, just change the body and badges, mm -hmm. they looked at that and they said, that's not as safe as what we want our car mm -hmm. to be, and they basically changed so many things that it were costing. They were, they too were much. in general, so I think over engineered. So their over engineers, let's say, if that's such a word, was their Achilles heel, wasn't it? Yeah. But then, you know, it's one of those things you never knew why you paid so much for a Saab until the crash. Crashed. We yeah. made this point when we had the knife had it, and you pointed out. The air pillars, the width of them, yeah, how huge. Yeah. The that's, chunky, are they? I mean, that's we, we, not even taking into account the door. Yeah. That's the thickness of the 75. Yeah. And then you've got the door as well. It's that, this, it's like that. There were some cars I've seen and been half of what the thickness of these were. They, they was mm. so chunky, weren't they? they were some massive. cars are even thinner than that. Yeah. Um, I'd always feel very safe in a sound from an older to yeah. when your last ones you can get. I can always remember my Mark 1 Fiesta. And because I had to repair parts of the end. Oh, oh, there was nothing there. <laughs> they were only about that thick. The yeah. Saab were like that. Yeah. I always remember as well Saab being a very sort of earlier adopter of safety equipment like airbags and things like that. They were seen on Saab's right on the front. Yes, they did introduce a lot of things. Um, I know, I think it's in the US, the, um, the Saab 900 that was, I think, um, I remember an airbag became standard equipment around 1990-ish. Yeah. I think it they didn't... And that didn't happen in the UK until the new 900 came out, I think about 1993. But it, it, it just goes to show you the, the, the early adopt of things like flash control systems and mm. ABS and things It like wasn't that. just also safety things, they got so obsessed with things that I think General Motors sent them under their cars with their sat by it, which they intended for Saab to keep. Mm. Yeah. And on the testing, when they had one of the GM Motors bosses coming over to Saab, he got in one of their sort of cars over the door and he looked and he says, this isn't our Saab now, and they've done their own. Mm. Basically, because they turned around and said, yours is crap and we can do better. And they actually did do better, but this is what stripped them of money. Yeah. And it's a shame, but I really wish he was still here as a car manufacturer on the whole. Mm. I wish someone could have said, look, we know you can survive, let's take you aside and let's keep you going and can you imagine how it be now? Yeah. More on that later. Mm. That might lead to something, that. Uh, but no, a really interesting brand style, very innovative, um, very distinctive. Um, I think one of the things I always remember is, with, with, say you were being followed by a star on the road. Yes. Um, you knew instantly what it was when you saw it. Mm, they had a distinctive You know, and they're very similar to the next manufacturer about to start talking about. You you know what was following you. Mm. And I think that was really, really... Um, you didn't need to know a lot about, about cars, cars yeah. to know that that was a sound and so on. I, mean, I, th I think <laughs> some of the styling of the later solves, um, sort of, particularly from the 90s, very... I think Marmite sort of styling. Uh, some became yeah. obviously a car. Some, um, some people liked them, some people like them. But that's what made them distinctive. That's what made them Was it sad that actually 
one of the cars they put the turbo name on and didn't yeah. the name turbo just suddenly take off on everything yeah. well you yeah, could get the first ones oh, that's, that's it yeah, yeah. But then, then everything went turbo crazy didn't you you could even get a pair of sunglasses that said turbo on them and, and things like that and I was going to say were, were, were they not first manufactured to mass put a turbo in the mass produced yeah. Yeah. Was, was that right so yeah. of course they had to make it known by putting the turbo badge on but like I said it made everything turbo well, crazy that was didn't a it? mental car it was and still is today yeah. you can still keep up with some of your good cars today can that you get one in good nick and the brake horsepower and that and its performance is still good I, I, remember, I remember one car in particular um, it was the final generate well this generation that was the 900 that became the 93 um, the convertible uh, it was called I think the Viggin it was a 2.3 litre Vignette the say was it the big that is what was it the banker garage I'm sure there was one called the 93 big I've yeah. got a little credit on the but because I, I nearly got this car I did I checked to see what it cost me insurance for the vehicle because I had the register and everything obviously we're filming it and I just told her it was the sat down yeah. and we come out and she came out with this name that was tagged on to it that yeah. sounded like what you said mm. Mm. I'm, I'm sure so, I mean Saab guys please uh Correct me, but I'm sure there's a 93 big, but it, uh, 93 a big, in. but I think it pumped out about 250 horsepower. I mm-hmm. think it was a 2.3 litre. It could be a two litre, obviously turbocharged. And I remember uh, magazine articles at the time. Uh, I'm sure I remember reading that the, the scuttle shake from it was horrendous because obviously you, mm-hmm. with the convertible, as you know, you lose a, a structural integrity when you take the roof off. Um, and then trying to put that much power through the front wheels, you just basically had little yeah, torques here and everywhere. <laughs> the, thing, the thing was that, I mean, I, that one that was in the garage, I, I remember filming part of the underneath. Mm. I don't think we actually used it because it, it was too dark, but I remember no. getting looking underneath and thinking, and you, you did the same. Mm, and you could was. see the extra stiffening. The it was the solid underneath, yeah. it? which it needed to be, but yeah. it, it looked like a, bit, like a tank. And yes, yeah, 21, 21 year old Saab, and it was yeah. fairly brilliantly on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen cars five or six year old in worse condition. Yeah, mm. and that was the thing. I just I think this is the thing that they were built to last. They, they were over engineered in every way the safety of them, the, the engines. You, they were just built to survive tush, tough, tough. Um, no, Scandinavian Southern winter. Well, yeah, so, which, which favoured for us over here well. And mm, yeah. It's nice to have a car over here that you know is going to last, isn't it? Yeah. Um, um, but it, it did. But it was an interesting manufacturer. And uh, now we're going to move on to the second manufacturer. Well, this about. is our connection. Some people might not actually see this, but um, we like Sabs as a whole. But we, we also really like, like and have had experiences with this next one. Yeah. Yeah. And at the time, they were all sort of one big company under the, uh, well, just coming out of the BL banner. And it was MG and Rover. Mm. Who at the time, were still regarded as separate companies uh, under the big corporate There was, wasn't there? there was <laughs> and of course, you had yeah. Austin as well, up to the, mm. about 1990, didn't yeah. it? Yes. Because the, yeah. um, one of the cars we're looking at, or, or talking about, is the MG Metro 6R4. Mm which was the Group B rallying car. The rally stage car. Which has yeah. just come on to the, uh, the, group, the Group B rallying stage, just as Group B rallying was banned. It was. Um, mainly due to the RS200. So, and I'm a Ford man, but I won't say not about that. <laughs> but it's a beautiful car. To be honest, it's uninitiated. Who may not know much about the Metro Six R Four? This is your man with the knowledge. So, tell us a bit about it. The MG Metro Six R Four was basically conceived as a all-out rally car. And for Group B rallying, you had to have a minimum of 200 examples built, which was supposed to be mm. road going. Yeah. Um, the 
Dif main differences between the Met standard Metro and the 6L4 are just about everything. But wasn't there only a couple of components that were the same as the, a, a normal Head Metro? Headlights, dashboard... I think the windscreen ones, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But considering most of this stripped out anyway, yeah. wasn't it, from the inside? Because so. the actual body was extended outwards. It was all flared, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, but it was just, just the arches, yeah. it was actually the bodywork. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the wheelbase would be wider yeah. than everything. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. um, because it had to accommodate the V6 engine that went in the back. Of course, so uh, technically you, you are talking a completely different breed of car, aren't you? Yeah, so where, generally where people would sit in the back of a Metro, there was an engine. Very similar, it reminds me of the uh, Renault 5 Turbo 2, mm. also, um, and obviously yes. later in the 90s they clear a V6. Um, where they had to put the engine in the back because yeah. it wasn't in the front. Yeah. 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 Now, they did share the uh, Metro's dashboard as well. Yeah, really. Uh, and of course, had the look of the Metro. But there wasn't much else that actually... Bear that, it was completely just one step away, wasn't it, from yeah. the... Yeah, because the bonnet was completely different. Yeah. The, obviously, the wheel arches were completely different mm -hmm. as well. And the, back, the wheels. <laughs> yep, and the back panel, the, the actual back hatch, mm. it was it all came out and round the side. It was a completely right, yeah. different component. Like a clamshell almost. Yeah. And I hear yeah. that this was a very good handling car, wasn't it? It was. Now the during development uh, they had test mules that were basically on the standard metro body body mm. shell. Uh, and it was a bit wavery. Mm. Uh, but it, it went like stink. What's the sort of power output with that putting out? The well, uh, power outputs? So they did never have a key sort of power output that they could base well, on. The the thing was it was built for Group B rallying. Yeah. So they had the power output for that. They only did a couple of, of Group B stages. Yeah. Um, but there was special dispensation given for that car. Right. So that it could compete in other rallies mm. so long as it was detuned. Right, okay, so yeah. So, so the power was actually yeah. brought back down. Yeah. Um, so that's why it's a bit unclear with the power. Yeah. Um, now, remember, we saw one of those in action. We in did. In Jersey. Yeah, we did. And you heard it. The only time you, it was up against a, what was for that time, a modern Ford rally car. That was based on the works, the, the works cars that were coming out at the same time. The focus could just about get away on the straight, mm -hmm. on the corners, that 6R4 was straight up its backside. Right, yeah. So it never really shook it off. No, no I mean, no. the road is there if you've ever been a very narrow and very tight, so the Metro um, just fitted perfectly, didn't mm -hmm. it? It just, mm -hmm. it just spun itself around corners, it just, it was, once it got to a corner, there was absolutely no stopping, and my gosh, did it draw a crowd. Yes. So the perspective <laughs> of the, probably the chap who was driving the Focus never lost sight of that car out of his rear view mirror, and it And the thing was, was like you it. didn't actually hear the Focus until it came round the corner in front of you. you but you could hear the Metro. You could <laughs> always hear the Metro. <laughs>
I think, yes, there are other legal versions. Because if you actually look at that, some of them, they also got registration plates. Yes, yeah, I'm sure I remember seeing, I heard read, reading about one a few years ago, and uh, that was the, the, the thing that stood out to me was that it was yeah. worth an absolute fortune. Mm. Mm. It was, yeah. yeah. But really expensive. Um, the thing was, was, as part of Group B uh, rallying, you had to have 200 examples and they had yeah. speed road going versions. Right. Um, and there was stock, um, it's, it's photographs of them if you look around, mm. you can mm. see them all uh, yeah. playing. Good. The, the thing is, that uh, obviously, you may realize I'm a few years younger than these chaps, um, so my um, history of, of, of the brand goes. Is a bit like what my parents and mum and dad were doing from the way So, talking of metros, um, back in 1990, uh, it was early 1990, he had a Austin Metro one litre clubman. Uh, now, the Austin Metro clubman was basically a run out, I believe, because the road to Metro was just, just about the Lord. It did, yes, mm. it did. It was the last one to have the. Uh, a plus engine and it was basically one out the rover but then we're just literally about to launch the rover metro as it was and the standout feature of the club was that it had a factory fitted sunroof ladies and gentlemen um, <laughs> <laughs> oh those are the days but it, it, it's funny you know, car trainers go I mean there was one point where if you had a really posh car it had a sunroof you had a sunroof <laughs> then when you had a really posh car you didn't have a sunroof yeah. And now when you've got a really posh car... You've got both. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> time has changed. It, it was a nice little car, but had no power at all. Um, and then in 1993, um, it was because it literally, the old, regi- the old registration yeah. had just come out in the UK, yeah. and my dad bought a, again, two-tone, Mm. Going back to the they seem, road, they seem to do this. They, they, they seem popular at the time. Um, the two ones. He bought. Was he a specials fan by any chance? <laughs> Not looking away. Specials. It was a two one four GSI uh, in white with the white over grey. So you have the yeah. grey yeah. bottom half that oh, come yeah, down yeah, from yeah. the bumpers and mm. the white on top. And my gosh, we really thought we'd gone up in the world. It had power, <laughs> power steering. Electric sunroof, electric windows, electric mirrors. Uh, we just thought it was the, the bee's knees. Yeah. Had up, not just the walnut dash, but the GSI had walnut all round the doors. <laughs> you got extra. It, 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 was like, it was brilliant, and I was absolutely gutted when you saw that. But yes, I, that was, uh, I have to say that when my metro, the metro I had, if you wanted power steering on that, you went to the gym. Mm. Yeah, that's a funny thing. You know, power steering was never fitted the standard. It was the metro. Yeah. The first couple of my cars, and I've had a lot, but my first two cars, they're nothing to do with these subjects. They're completely different other car makes. But um, neither had power steering, and you really want that like, when you're yeah. around to park and things like that. And then when you do eventually get a car with power steering, you think it's broken. Blank shit for yeah. the ones at SD1. I mean, the, the particular car we've, we've got, oh, we've looked at is the Golden Wonder we've had that on yeah that's not yeah, I, I was blown away when I saw that car for yeah. the first time for now you. here's a connection with the with, that, with the SD1 V8 and the Metro 604 when they actually developed the engine rather than develop a complete new engine what they did was basically saw the last two cylinders off the V and <coughs> That was literally it. Yeah, it was. Uh, however, <laughs> however, that engine, even though yeah, after the 6R4, that engine actually went on and stayed alive and was actually in the Jaguar XJ220. Now, if that's not a test of an engine, I don't know what is for it to make its way then to a Jaguar as well and keep on going. Mm. And, that that was car, and that car was absolutely ballistic. Yeah, it? It was. It was yeah. I remember at the time, uh, I think people were disappointed they didn't come because Jaguar said, said at the time, I think, was it, was it going to come with a V12 or something like that? Yeah, there was all sorts of things that were gonna, they said. It came out with V6 for yeah. Metro. But it was still mm. absolutely yeah. brilliant. <laughs> when I think back of Rover's cars, and we're going to come on to another one of them in, in a minute, the R8 200. Um, which always stays in my mind as a, just a brilliant all-round car. Yeah, it, was. it was so classy, it 
you sat in it and you, you really felt you was in something special. It was well built around you. The paint finish on them cars was incredible yeah. um, compa- compared to other ones at the time. Well, the, uh, the Honda equivalent of that car, um, Honda, of course, primarily being Japanese, didn't actually have a diesel engine. Mm-hmm. So when, the, when you actually bought those Hondas, it was actually a Rover diesel. Mm-hmm. Which came off the same production line. But then was put in the But then the R8, the diesel in that, was that, I believe it was a Peugeot engine one, take the diesel in that. It was an um, XUD, I think, engine they call it, because you could buy it as a 218D. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, non turbo, you could buy the 218 uh, diesel non turbo, you could buy it with the turbo, yeah. And apparently, the turbo one was just absolutely brilliant, it mm. was way better than the um, non turbo. Bear in mind with the R8 as well, the, there'd been a lot of changes, haven't there? Mm-hmm. Because you've got the 800 series that was uh, coming in, yeah, you'd got the R8 that was mm-hmm. coming in, and the one thing they built, they both built on. Although the 800 later was the hatchback design of the SV1. Yeah. Because it yeah, proved to be yeah. really, really popular. Mm-hmm. But here's a story for you. When they were test, test, you know, they were showing off the, uh, the, the, the new 800, and they, they flew everybody out to Switzerland to do this, and mm. there were police chiefs and all sorts. And they were showing this new 800. The, you know the first thing that the police chiefs did when they got back into Britain? They bought up every single SD one they could. Because, I mean, you can get a whole pile of traffic cones in the back of an SD one. The police absolutely loved the yeah, SD one yeah. as a police car, didn't they? And yeah. when, they, when they'd done all their applications uh, <coughs> to it, mm. it was the fastest car on mm. British roads. The only other car that could beat it was the <coughs> modified Jaguars. You can see the crossover where you were seeing the 800s and the SD1, but because you were still actually, seeing a lot of SD1s. There was a shortage of V8 SD1s. People were buying V8 SD1s as, mm. as they were coming out of production, and there was a waiting list for them because the Metropolitan Police had bought them all. <laughs> well, I, I um, remember someone I went to school with, and when his dad passed away, he and two of his dad's car, uh, and that was an SD1 blower, yeah. and he came down one day and he said, oh, let's go on a ride for this, and it had all this cream interior, and all that, and we went off in this car, and it was like an ocean liner, it was massive. Mm. The bonnet, when you sign it, just seemed to go on and on and on, and he was throwing it round these corners mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah. and twisty winding rounds going to Castle Hill. As if it were a little hot hatch. Mm. This though was why it was such a successful rally car. Yeah, because it really cornered like crazy. It did. I couldn't believe. It. I thought it it complemented his driving. It yeah. made him look a better driver than he was the way it was going around these cars. Incredibly nimble for a big car. It yeah. was. I mean, yeah. you had a car that could literally turn on the sixpence, mm. and it was huge. I mean, the seventy five is a big car. Mm. But it's a, it's actually smaller than an SD1. Mm. It's not as yeah. wide, it's not as long. But the thing that was key with the SD1 was the ratio for the wheelbase mm. was perfect. It was spot on for the size, mm. the width and the length. And the other thing that helped was because the engine was mounted, because it was rear wheel drive, the, the engine was fairly straight through, mm. you could have these huge wheel arches. Yeah. Mm. And you, you see they had this massive turning circle. Well, you had this massive ability to yeah. turn your wheels. Yeah. Yeah. And the turning circle was tiny. The one thing I liked about the SD1 when we were younger as well, at a first sight, it gave the impression of it being a fast car without even moving. Yeah. The design of it. It, it was based on the, on the Ferrari. Yeah, Ferrari Daytona, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, there's a bit of slamming to And if you look on AR Online, there's um, at the Rover SD1 development store, mm. um, you can actually see the customer, the, the like, like, like customer clinics where yeah. they come in yeah. and the SD1 was sat next to a Ferrari Daytona, mm. and it's like, wow. So yeah. How happy were Ferrari at that though, do you think? No idea, <laughs> I don't think you care. Is that, is that, yeah. Do you maybe they might have seen it as a bit of a compliment, the fact that there was a car from Rover that was slightly like one of their own? You might have seen it as, as a cheap cop out of theirs. It was more of a compliment saying your style mm. is that good. I think the car was that different. They couldn't yeah. really say you copied. Yeah. 
I mean, when you think about when you think about today, there's that many cars that look so alike. If you just took the badges off and swapped them around. But the fact Um, is, with the Rover SD one, I think it was more of a compliment than how that car looked. Yeah. 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 But you remember, you remember the uh, when we saw the Golden Wonder one, we could get into it and uh, around that. Yeah. Um, that that particular car showed a lot of um, it had a lot of modification. For example, it's a dry sump car. Mm. Uh, so if you did end up going over a rock and knocking the sump off the car, it didn't really matter because it was basically a flat body underneath. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and it was it, it basically all the oil came out the back. Yeah. And the, yeah. And the, um, Spare the, real used to be. The Golden Wonder SD one, as featured on the channel, has an incredible history and story behind it. So uh, oh, yeah, I'm sure Malcolm will link that to yeah, um, video mean, to that. The, the yeah the um, well, well we'll actually put with the footage, footage in, but the yeah, the, the the owner um, he bought it. It'd been converted into a short wheelbase, so it's about the same width as a or same length as a Ford Escort. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he, you know, knowing the history of the car, he's actually restored it to its, its full, it's full proper yeah. length. Yeah. And a lot of work's gone into that car. Mm. Yeah, and it's a lot of history behind that, and it's been through some rough times, hasn't it? But mm. I think I pointed out in one video, it's a bit like a phoenix under flames, hasn't it? The way it's yeah. risen back, back, back from the glory, hasn't yeah. it? So, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, my brother watched that video on the channel, and yeah, yeah, it's a really good piece. He's absolutely moved it by the story behind the car. Yeah, and yeah, I guess the like at the end the fact that they eventually got to see the car again yeah, and yeah. they really loved it and yeah. it's, it, it was a nice ending to the, the whole story is. Yeah. And that sort of sums up the SD one. The thing is, um, it, that car was originally driven by Tony Pond as well. Right. Who was, the, who was one of the works drivers for Rover. Mm. And if you ever look up Tony Pond and SD1, it's actually amazing that that car ever survived because he doesn't seem to have a lot of luck with it. And now Britain's Tony Pond, co-driven by Rob Arthur, is on the start line of the first stage. Go. 200, go sharpish left and right through gate. This is the Rover's third rally outing in Britain this season. The previous two being the All Tarmac Circuit of Ireland and the Manx International, where Pond finished a splendid third. Because we, we've never taken this car in the forest, so we don't really know what it'll do. I am very optimistic. I mean, the car in testing seems seems very good, but when you test, you test against yourself. You don't test against other people. This is the test. 250 comes land, long right. has had some widely publicised mishaps on Sunday runs of the Lombard RAC. Anxious not to repeat the process and make any mistakes so early in the event, he is quite clearly treating the roads of Nosley with some respect. The big, powerful 280 horsepower rover being threaded carefully over this very first test. But Pond's luck is about to run out once again. Let's get out and have a look. The car's sickening impact against a tree spells serious damage, and it's quite clear the rover isn't going to go much further. Pond tries desperately to extricate the stricken machine, but it's to no avail. It's gone, isn't it? Co-driver Rob Arthur voices the two men's worst fears. From outside, the carnage looks even worse as marshals spring to the team's aid. Somehow or another, they're going to try and get it back on the road and to the end of the special stage. by hordes of eager hands willing him on, Pond struggles valiantly with the car and eventually succeeds in reaching the end of the test. 
But there's nothing that can be done to avert an unmitigated disaster for Austin Rover and a very personal tragedy for Tony Pond and Rob Arthur. Basically, he was three wheels on his wagon. <laughs> <coughs> In a reliant SD1. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But yes, I mean, really interesting car, the SD1. Mm. Um, obviously, didn't always get the best time in terms of press with its reliability and no. things like that. And then again, I don't think many British Australian cars did at the time anyway. No, I think what let it down English. with everything was not actually the cars, it was what was going on with... British Leyland and everything as a whole at the beginning and the strikes and all sorts of things now the government one and all of that and everything was so up in the air they just I can't say came a slight but of a joke didn't they but, then, points, but a lot of the a lot of the things with the uh, with the strikes and things like that it wasn't always the rover and it wasn't always the rover employees that were actually on strike sometimes mm. it would be the seat Manufacturers. That's sometimes it, yeah. it would be people at Lucas who are supplying all the parts, and then of course yeah. they've got these. They've got all these rover workers who can't work because there's no parts coming in. Yeah. And but of course it was then blamed on rover. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was I think points yeah. in the middle man, one is the thing. Yeah. I think that's probably a discussion for another day. <laughs> yeah. Get into politics. We're, we're still not going to get into politics. Uh, about that, but no. moving on from the SD1, the interesting car uh, as it was, we move on to some more modern stuff, um, and well. And you've seen on the channel a lot, uh, Malcolm, of course, owns a Rover 75. Now, we've all owned Rovers and MG, Rovers and MGs ourselves. We have, yeah. Uh, Malcolm is the only one that still does at this moment in time. Um, so, what do you like about your 75, Malcolm? Why is it, why is it hold a special place to you? It's an absolute mile muncher. It is, we, we can vouch for that. Uh, we, we definitely can, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, this thing is 16 years old and it's doing a more punishing job than most modern cars will actually do ever in their lifetime. It's not really missing a beat, is it? No. No. Um, it's. I mean, but part of that is going to be down to the BMW electronics and the BMW engine that's in there. Yeah, yours is a diesel engine. Yeah. yeah. But having said that, it, I mean, I. I what? Thursday I was up in Newcastle, so set off at six o'clock, drove up to Newcastle, did my job, drove home again, mm. and it's, yeah, yeah. Well, um, it's, it's a favourite on overdrive, that car, certainly, because it actually suits us very well for our filming requirements. Well, yeah, a lot of people don't actually realise it, but it's a bit of a workhorse, isn't it, it as is. well? Yeah. This Newcastle car, filming. it not only features in front of the camera, it features behind the camera more often than not. Mm. And the reason it's really good for our filming requirements is because it's such a compromise, it reminds me very much of a, a, a Citroen, a big Citroen. Yeah. Mm. It's got such a brilliant ride, we use it for filming, uh, we mount cameras on the car, mm. uh, for doing shots of other cars when we're driving along, um, it's got a huge boot for all the filming equipment. Um, it just does everything that we need it to do, really, doesn't it? It's it's just, it, is, it is the fateful <coughs> workhorse, isn't it? Yeah, you one. wouldn't think that a, an ideal filming car would be a Rover 75, but in fact, it actually works brilliantly, doesn't it? Does. <laughs> it does. Um, I think, I, I can't actually think, because, because I can't actually think of a modern car that would do as well, because it soaks up the bumps. So the camera's steady. Steady, mm. yeah. yeah. And you know, most modern cars are quite harsh on yeah, yeah, they can be, like yeah. That. So you just wouldn't get that steadiness. So it's got a huge boot for all the equipment. It's also got a huge boot with a lid, which is brilliant because we can mount cameras on the back of it. Yes. Um, good idea that. It's just it just yeah. And there's there's plenty of room inside. So you can take a full chrome with you. Yeah. Uh, in comfort as well. Like yeah. there's, there's not many cars that you could actually fit three people in the back. I mean, we whizzed mm. up to Blackpool last week to film the Saab that we were talking about, and whizzed up there, whizzed back, and yeah. I'll be honest, I, we saw sort of back with it, I believe, for an hour. It corners as well while you're trying to eat a Big Mac. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, you can eat some mat holes in the back of it. Yes, yeah, it's not very that, That's one that tastes dumb. <laughs> um, but yes, we're good in it. It is. I, I've driven the car on a couple of occasions. I have. Uh, with well, Malcolm yeah. and uh, with the car with me uh, for certain reasons. And I love driving it as well. It is nice drive. And yeah, I've never driven one before. And the first time I drove it, I think, was when my ST was being filmed. Yeah. And I was following along and things like that. And 
I was beginning to enjoy driving it and thinking, oh, do we want an iCar? Yeah. <laughs> and I was liking the drive, it was a nice car. I drove it up in Northumberland, when yeah, we up yeah. in Northumberland. Um, again, first time for me driving a 75. Took a bit of new to the size for this Ford, it's a big car, especially when you used to drive in the smaller stuff. But then again, it doesn't but, feel like a huge car though. No, it, 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 no it doesn't actually. It, it's just brilliant, wasn't it? It glided over the bumps and, and you didn't notice. Um, and to know what you want to add about the car? Um, it's, got mean, good, it's got good rear parking sensors. Yeah. <laughs> Toe <Totally. laughs> <Totally. laughs> You know when you're getting too close to a wall, you stop. Yeah. <laughs> All the pavement outside Ian Clark's house. Malcolm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best empty looks in the tow bar after that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's, it was a brilliant car, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing was as well, the a lot of people forget they were quite successful in saloon car racing as well, yeah. the seventy fives, um, mainly around the V six, mm. and also uh, so was the MG. TF, which wasn't known as at that point, they did a, a racing. I was say, I remember I've seen that go used to go yeah. down the track before. Yeah. Uh, didn't they have like a roll cage over the top? Or... Yeah, and then they had a hard top which they yeah. sort of yeah. blended in. Um, now, that particular car uh, is still around, yeah. and it was what they used, and technically the MGF was still around. Yeah, they hadn't yeah, announced the yeah. TF, and they used it as a sort of test bed to see how people would react to the new TF styling. Mm. And uh, it, God knows what they would have done if everyone turned around and went, and all like that, but everyone seemed to love it, and that's what then became the TF. And talking of TF, of course, you were one of them as well, didn't you? Yeah, uh, I had one of them and MGF as well for about mm. three weeks, until some nice Audi driver ran into the back of me. Mm. Funnily enough, they want, they were, when they were designing the MGF, they were trying to get it, they were going to get it into America and relaunch the MGB. Which would have been MGB brilliant because the MGB was very popular. In yeah, it place, was. Wasn't it? But the thing was, BMW didn't want them doing that because BMW bought Rover about that, around that time in the middle of the, the MGF development. Uh, and basically said, no, we're not selling that in America because we're selling the Z3. Bear in mind, the one um, thing that BMW insisted on for the MGF was that they made the A pillar, the windscreen, as strong as the Z3 in case somebody rolled over. Mm. And that was BMW's only meddling. I remember that because I remember the MGTF, which was basically the same car, of course, was crash tested by your own cap. Mm. It got a four star frontal safety rating, which at the time for a two seater convertible was very good. Mm. Um, in fact, it was better than some Rover models. Yeah. The MGF was the, uh, was the highest rated one ever mm. for a convertible when it was tested. Mm. And when the TF was brought in, because they put the extra bracing in, it was 20% structurally stronger than the F. And the F was the strongest structural car. So mm. it was a relatively time. safe convertible at the time. Yes. Even though it didn't have a rollover. As long as it didn't roll over, then yeah. the problem. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, moving on, we, we've had other MGs and Rovers as well, and you, Craig, personally have had some, so I'll let you mention some of your Yeah, well, well, I said, moving on to the more modern stuff, I said, like I said, I'm a few years younger than these chaps, um, and I didn't get a Rover myself. Uh, until last year, early uh, last year, and regular viewers to the channel will know which car we're on about. It's the Silver 25 that we featured earlier on this year. Which we filmed, yeah. yeah. Brilliant car. Mm. Thoroughly enjoyed driving it for the time mm. I had it. My dad had that before me, and then after he gave that to me because we needed a car at the time, and I went for that. Of course, as we touched on in the video, it was one of the last made. Yeah. Uh, it was the GSI. Um, really nice spec on the car. Full leather, yeah. air conditioning. Fantastic. I was impressed by the seats. Yeah. Mm. Uh, the only 45 yeah. seats they put in the last yeah. ones of that. Yeah, yeah you see, I, I liked um, little touches on the dash of change and everything from my 200 and... The modern and yeah, and things, things, things like yeah, that. Yeah. Some nice touches. Um, the yeah. handle's white marble. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, it had stuff like factory fitted rear carpet sensor, which was pretty yeah. good on a small car back in It was a one-spec car, wasn't it, that one? Yeah. yeah. Um, really, really sad to see that going on. I'm, I'm 
really want to get my hands on another one at some point. It was a fantastic mm. car. And you were quite unusual. You did get a few people sort of... Because yeah, the Rovers are, even the more the last ones like that, are now starting to become a bit of a rarity. Well, they are, yeah. It was a fence list as well, wasn't it? It, it was, was, yeah. yeah. And... Well, uh, it's, you, yours was the 25, and uh, yeah. mine was the 200. Yeah. Uh, and actually, my Rover 200 was my first ever, out of all the cars I've had, it was my first ever brand new car. Mm-hmm. All my others have been used or passed yeah. on or whatever, and anything like that. And this was my first opportunity of ever going to a dealership and um, picking a brand new car of what I wanted. And mine was in the Brooklyn's Green. Yeah. Can you see a link that I picked Brooklyn's Green with my last name in Brooklyn? <laughs> and I got the spec of everything I wanted. And Do you remember what spec it was that? Do you know, I, I, I what engine it had, maybe? It was only a 1.4. Yeah. Exactly the same as like mm-hmm. said that was. Um, with it being a first brand new car, I had to be also careful with insurance and things like that. Mm. But I wasn't so fussed about what engine size I got, it was just the fact it was going to be a brand new car. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, I mean... It was a break from the norm from... My first ever cars was Vauxhalls and things like that and Fords, and it was a whole new bag. So to sum up then, um, well, okay, well, here's a strange little twist, because obviously we, we, we sort of mentioned earlier with the Saab, um, we mentioned how things are still trending along. Saab is technically, with a lot of Chinese investments, still around with the mm. National Electric Vehicle Sweden on NEVS. Mm. And they're using the 9.3 yeah. uh, mm. body shell to build an electric, an all electric car. You don't hear the name, do you? But they're using the body shell on that, yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, but not only that, MG is still around, again under Chinese ownership. So of course, they've got the new model of yeah. major cars. And the new yeah. MG6, which is stunning, by the way, is due out in this country. Yes, in there's the new year. one coming out, isn't it? Yeah. It looks fantastic. And the original MG6, it looked okay. The Eurobox, um, and didn't really sell well. Yeah, I, I saw a couple on the roads, and I actually saw one in it like it's like a copper colour. Yes. And yeah. I actually thought, from a fact, when I saw the car, I thought, you know, it don't look half bad, actually. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, I test drove a couple of MG6s, uh, one of which was that Cop Cup. Yeah. Um, and when it first came out, I thought, what a really nice looking, stylish mm. hatchback that was. And the saloon, of course, it is a saloon as well, mm. uh, for a while. The thing that disappointed me was when I got in the car. Yeah, uh, the interior. The, it wasn't a bad design, the outside I thought was very stylish, but the interior, it was the interior quality that let, let right. the plastics and things. But, now, here's another thing though. So we've got NG, they're still around. They're, they're, you know, they're, yeah, you know, yeah. they're Chinese, but they are still around. Saab technically is still around under the NEVS brand, mm. as, of, as of the vehicles. But what about Rover? Well, as we know, you can't go and buy a new Rover these days. No. Uh, what is the situation with the brand? Could they, the brand. If, if, if it was... Um, Enough money was pumped into it. Could they? Is it physically possible for them to be revived? Yes, because the brand is owned by Tata, who own Land Rover and Range Rover. Well, as we know, they're Land still thriving, aren't they? Yeah. Um, but so the thing is, that's tied into those. So vehicles. technically, they're still tied in with them. So basically, the Rover brand, in a sense, you could say, is actually still going. Yeah. But here's the strange thing: Tata are planning to launch a car. Right. Do you right. know what they're going to call it? Go on. The Road Rover. The Road Rover. I'm not so sure about Isn't that. Isn't that just a Rover? As the opposed road. to the Land Rover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Land Rover, Range Rover. Right. Road so you've got your Land Rover. And your Road Rover. And then you've got a Road Rover. Yeah. Is it something, basically, I no. don't like China. Just a normal car. Yeah. Yeah. I know like China don't say Rover, same no, they don't no, say what more. Uh, uh, that with their name, which, which that's is... That's they had. Yeah, which um, they technically have, that's what they call their cars in China, yeah. their Rue cars. Do you um, think Tata's having some issues of pronouncing things on them? No, I don't got, so, because wouldn't they then rename Range Rover and Land Rover? True, but well, yeah, 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 it's... But yeah, technically the Rover brand still exists under Tata. So we've established that the Rover brand is actually still out there. And, 
and Europe, it's still quite well regarded in several territories as well. So mm. it could actually be launched again as a luxury. Well, this is the thing. I mean, it, it, I think it depends on whether Tata are prepared to put the time and money and effort into relaunching the Rover brand. Because I think if they did that, especially in UK and Europe, it wouldn't do a half bad. I mean. My, my mind goes back to when we were in Portugal a couple of years ago. Mm. Yeah. I, I was astonished to see so many rovers still on the road. Yeah. Mm. In, 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 in and in, in, when we were in Spain as well. Yeah. I was, I was amazed. You see, what struck me is when MG Rover was, let's say, in the hands of uh, BMW. No, not BMW. When, when, no, when it was all going up in the air, they were in the hands of receivers and all. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. And you didn't know what was going to happen with anything. Uh, a lot of places sold cars off cheaply. Yeah. And I noticed the amount of people that bought ZRs and not lot because they wouldn't watch it. And I thought, do you know what? If you'd have had that dedication and actually bought the cars in the first place, it's still be going. How much the company would have still be going? Well. I think that pretty much sums it up because if we go on much longer, we're going to be here till next year. <laughs> uh, we'll be going on as long as what the history of the cars have made. But, um, well, I suppose we should sum up 2018 for Overdrive. Yes. That is pretty much it. Um, it's been a fast but eventful year, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, we, we did have changes, i.e., Craig came on board around episode 10. Personal changes that made us change all the filming schedules and. <laughs> Yes, we, behind the scenes we've had a lot of things that happen, as you saw with one of the BMW special, which does mention the reason why my yeah. dad sadly passed away. I'm sure he's up there looking down on us, wishing as well, and getting probably extra views to watching our film. But I think, think on, on, on a personal level, uh, for all three of us, um, it's, it's been a tough year for yeah. all three of us. Uh, we've come through a lot in our own individual lives. It has. Uh, Overdrive has been a uh, fantastic um, way of, well, I suppose a distraction to all three of us, hasn't it? It has, yeah, it, it, it has. and it's been, a, let's say, a godsend to be able to do it, and it's a pleasure to do it for you guys, and uh, we hope you can get some feedback and things from what we do. Um, we will all see you in 2019 with episode 14, won't we? Yeah. Um, final word, I think... Appropriately, should go to the uh, to the boss. Um, yes, I would like to just yeah. quickly mention um, a lot that you don't see um, behind the scenes is this chap here. He does all the editing, all the um, all that kind of stuff. All it the is the boss. It. Um, Malcolm does a huge, huge amount of work um, behind the scenes on the website, um, on the channel, and obviously sorting of the videos out that you may not realise. Um, so big thanks to Malcolm for that. Yeah, uh, it is appreciated by us both. In it, it is because I wouldn't know where to start with things <laughs> like this. Uh, and like I said, it, if it so wasn't for Malcolm, we, 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 we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here, basically. Yeah, and, and, and thanks to you guys for watching. Because again, without you, um, we won't be here. And please offer feedback, good or bad. We take it all on board. So we will say what turned out to be a hobby has now turned out to be something that. We can't imagine not, not, not doing it. Yeah. I, if Overdrive stopped tomorrow, I would be bitterly disappointed. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, appropriately, I think final word to know from anything to say. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to do. It's ch it's a challenge getting it all in. in it, yeah, I guess I couldn't actually do it without you guys. Yeah. I couldn't do it on my own. Well, yeah, we all chip in in his own way, but. Uh, like I said, it is hats off to Malcolm how he, how he sorts everything out and you'll see the end product. But. Um, we didn't want to let Malcolm down. We hit a time where Malcolm wasn't sure whether we were going to continue with this, and we've made damn sure we are doing. And it's good. It's a cool thing for all three of us. So, um, Malcolm. So it's not. It's not. A, it's not a bombshell or a conclusion. <laughs> it's just a wrap up to the end of this year, and you will be seeing more of them as in the new year. So, with that, it's Happy New Year. Happy New Year, and we'll see, see you here on the other side. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Now we'll get a kettle on and get that on film as well. <laughs>